Happy holidays and welcome to another episode of Five Things, a web series dedicated to answering the five burning tech questions you have about technologies and workflows in the media creation space, plus tech stuff I dig and how it's used. I'm your host, Michael Thomas, and as we jump into 2017, we're going to cover popular post-production myths and the truth about them. Let's get started. This is a very, very common question. It doesn't matter what forum you contribute on or troll on, this question is always asked. If I take my compressed camera footage, like an 8-bit H.264, and convert it to a more robust codec, like 10-bit ProRes or DNX, will it look better? And it does make topically some sense. If I put something small into something bigger, well, that's better, right? Unfortunately, the math just doesn't support this. Transcoding to a better codec won't add quality that wasn't there to begin with. This includes converting from an 8-bit to a 10-bit or greater source, or even converting from a compressed color sampling value like 420 to something a bit more robust like 422. Think of it this way. Imagine this glass of eggnog is the sum quality of your original video. Adding rum or not is strictly your call. And you decide you want more of it. So you pour the eggnog into a larger glass. You're not getting more eggnog. You're just getting a larger container of the same amount of eggnog. An empty space is not occupied by your eggnog, it's filled with empty bits. That's empty space. I, I never taught the computer how to read empty space. What transcoding will do, however, is make your footage easier for your computer to handle in terms of rendering and playback. Less compressed formats like ProRes and DNX are easier for the computer to play than, say, an H.264. This means you can scrub easier in your timeline and render faster. Now, this is mainly due to long op versus non long op, which I discuss here. In fact, if you want to get real nitpicky, ProRes and DNX are not lossless codecs. They're lossy, which means when you transcode using them, you will lose a little bit of information. You most likely won't notice, but it's there. Or should I say not there? Now, there is some validity to a unique situation. Let's say you shoot with a 4K camera. Perhaps it samples at 8-bit color depth with 420 color sampling. By transcoding to a 1080p file, you can dither the color sampling to 444 and dither the sample depth to 10-bit. However, as you've probably surmised, this comes at a loss of resolution from 4K all the way down to HD. The two go hand in hand, but you can do one without the other. Let me explain. HDR, when we talk about acquisition, involves capturing material with a greater range of light and dark, stops, as well as color depth. It's a combination of multiple factors. Shooting in a log format, whether it's S-Log, Log-C, or another variant, is used to gain as much data as possible based on the limitations of that camera sensor. So, let's say you have a camera that shoots an SDR, standard dynamic range, like Rec. 709, which has been the broadcast standard for almost 27 years. But camera tech has gotten better in the past 27 years. So, how do we account for this better ability of the camera within this aging spec? We can shoot in a log format. Log reallocates the limited range of the Rec. 709 color space to the parts of the shot that you need most. Log simply allows us to use more of the camera's inherent abilities. You have inherent abilities that others do not have. Not like you, dear. No. Not yet. But it's there. So, while you get the extra abilities that the camera sensor allows, it doesn't give you the complete HDR experience. Now, if you shoot with a camera that isn't constrained to a Rec. 709 standard and offers a log format, you now have the best of both worlds, greater dynamic range, and a format that allows you to expose this extra realm of color possibilities. Color is a funny thing. Oddly enough, it happens to change depending on what device you're looking at it on. Imagine that! That's why grading color on a similar device as to those who are consuming it is so important. So it stands to reason that if you're grading a TV show, well, you should grade on a video monitor. If most of your views will be racked up on YouTube, well, then I'd grade on a computer monitor. To be more specific, it boils down to more than just color accuracy. Computer monitors don't have true blacks as they are backlit, and many video monitors are moving towards OLED technology, which is not backlit. Also, their gamma curves are different, 
and this overall resulted contrast range is simply different from video monitors. So it works with your television? Yes, 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 yes. It will work on any television or video monitor. Sure, various computer monitors do have profiling to try and counteract this. Computer monitors are usually sRGB devices, while most video monitors are traditionally Rec. 709. And while their primaries are the same, we can run into color management issues. With Rec. 709, you know what's coming out on the other side of the pipe. When we introduce computer monitors, we're not only dealing with the color management that the OS is doing, but also the hocus pocus the computer monitor is doing to emulate video. That's just too many cooks in the kitchen. Now I'll admit that given the split methods of consumption of media nowadays, that is, viewing TV shows online and viewing web videos on your TV, it's very difficult to get one grade to rule them all. On top of that, we have a wide variety of monitor types, from TFT and IPS LCD to LED to OLED to those aging plasmas. But the logic still stands. Grade for the main medium your content will be consumed on and then check the grade on the alternatives. This happens commonly on location. The talent yells or talks louder and the recording gets blown out. It may sound something like this. It may sound something like this. The best we can hope to do is triage this. You're not going to fix it. Well, why is that, Michael? When dialogue is overmodulated, the incoming signal is too powerful for the device recording it. This means that the information you're trying to record gets lost at peak values. Think of it in terms of video. Let's say you set your exposure for a great shot of the ocean, but the sky is blown out. There isn't much you can do to get that detail in the sky back. It's simply too much information for the camera sensor to handle. Much the same as audio overmodulation is for the device recording it. Here we see the audio as it occurs in the wild. This is what it looks like after it's recorded. You can see the peaks, the high volume is lost. Now, if the overmodulation is slight, it may be partly salvageable. Many audio plugins try and guess what information may have been lost during the clipping. However, often the restored portion of the dialogue lacks clarity and detail and can introduce distortion artifacts, which then leads to the question, does this treated clip sound better or just sound different? You wanna hear the most annoying sound in the world? And I won't torture you with that one. It's normally at this point in the conversation that one should start looking into alt takes or trying to reconstruct the words needed manually. And if enough of the dialogue is foobard, arrange for an ADR session. Very often, I speak to those who tell me, well, we plan on shooting almost 20 terabytes of material, so 20 terabytes of storage should be enough. And while the 20 terabyte number changes, the common assumption is still the same, that the storage you buy is the capacity you get. This is unfortunately not the case. Let's break it down. Ever seen this notice on those hard drives you buy? Ah yes, the legalese fine print. This is essentially accounting for the difference of 24 bytes between marketing one kilobyte and how large a kilobyte is in reality. It's legalese, and for you number nerds, it's base eight versus base two math. For everyone else, that means you get 930 gigs available for every one terabyte. That's a 7% loss before you've even installed the drive. And we're just getting started. Now we want a RAID, that is, redundancy in the event one of our many drives fail. There's a sacrifice for this redundancy, space. The most common RAID formats in video nowadays are RAID 5 and RAID 6. RAID 5 will consume one entire disk and RAID 6 will consume two entire disks. Obviously, this can be a huge bite in space depending on how many disks are in your array. If you have a basic 3-drive array, RAID 5 will cost you a third of your space. In a more common 12-drive array, you'll only lose 8% of your storage. RAID 6 will double all of those. Again, you need two drives. But let's go conservative so as not to scare you too much and assume RAID 5 and ballpark a 15% loss in space. This puts our drive space at about 790 gigabytes free. We're already 21% down. Lastly, best practice for spinning drive performance is to not fill the drive up past 80%.
performance hits are common after we eclipse the 80% capacity mark. This brings our grand total to 632 gigs usable on a one terabyte drive for best performance. That's a loss of almost 40%. Have more post myths other than these five? Ask me in the comments section. Also, please subscribe and share this tech goodness with the rest of your techie friends. Be sure to check out the rest of this series and all of the other great learning content at moviola.com. Until the next episode, learn more, do more. Thanks for watching.